Good morning. A man steps on the pulpit, on the platform, actually. With charisma and authority, he raises his voice and addresses the crowds. We are convinced that the people need and require faith, he starts. We have therefore undertaken the fight against the atheist movement. And with a voice that penetrates the hearts of people, he devotes himself to a fight for righteousness, to stand against evil and ungodliness, and initiates a new era of positive Christianity. He continues, We want to fill our culture again with the Christian spirit. So we go forward with a profound faith in God and to our future. Would that which we have achieved been possible if God had not helped us? This is the Christianity of an honest confession, for behind it stand not words but deeds. If positive Christianity means the love of one's neighbor, the tending of the sick, the closing of the poor, the feeding of the hungry, then it is we who are the more positive Christians. As a Christian, I have no duty to allow myself to be cheated, but to be a fighter for truth and justice. Remain strong in your faith as you were in former years. In this faith and its closeness of unity, our people can go straight forward on its way, and no power on earth will avail to stop it. Lord, we will not let you go. Bless now our fight for freedom. As the crowds cheer and applaud, he announces that the years of depression are over, and a new era of positive Christianity has begun. His name? Adolf Hitler. With Germany, yeah, where do we go from there? <laughs> Ten years after his promise to lead Germany into a glorious future, after his proclamation, we regard Christianity as the unshakable foundation of all morality. The country that followed him lies in rubble and ruins. Millions of people are killed. Six million Jews gassed in concentration camps. And to this very day, people are trying to understand how things could have come that far and how the world's greatest evil could have come in the disguise of the greatest faith. And some wonder if something like this could ever happen again. Would people stand the ground or fall for it all over again? The Bible says in Mark 13, 22, At that time, if anyone says to you, He is Christ or there is Christ, do not believe it. For false Christs and prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that was possible. So be on your guard. I've told you everything ahead of time. When I look back at what this dark chapter of German history, I am ashamed. How could this have happened? How could the majority of people and even Christian churches have been so misled? In retrospect, we all know that Hitler was one of the world's greatest evil, a dictator, a madman. We know about World War II, the concentration camps, the Holocaust. But before all this happened, this evil was hidden. He came as a wolf in sheep's clothing to mislead and to deceive. And with Germany going through a great depression after World War I, high unemployment, economic and political turmoil, he, gave, he came to give people hope, patriotism and pride again, to create jobs, to build the Autobahn, to make Germany a great and powerful nation again. He came as a herald of a new revelation and declared that divine providence had appointed him to be the Führer and to lead the people into a new and glorious future, and that God was on their side. The Bible warns us clearly to stand our ground and speak out against the false doctrines of our times. Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. So Hitler created a positive Christianity, bright at the outside, but shallow at its core. And slowly but steadily, the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
of sin, repentance, salvation, and eternal life was replaced with a gospel of nationalism, patriotism, prosperity, and victory for the German people. And once people realized where all this was going, it was too late. The Gestapo secret police had woven its fatal spider web all across Germany. Hitler had promised to fight evil and restore order in Germany after World War I, fight corruptions, crooks, and criminals. And he did. First, the thieves and the robbers were defined a criminal and were arrested. Then the socialists and the communists, then the homosexuals and Jehovah Witnesses, then the Jews, then the professing Christians, and soon everyone who resisted Adolf Hitler and the Nazi ideology was defined a criminal, arrested, and put into concentration camps. And those who took a stand now often paid with their lives. Pastor Martin Niemöller, a friend of Dietrich Bonhoeffer and one of the leaders of the German resistance and the professing church, later said, when they came for the socialists, I didn't speak out because I wasn't a socialist. When they came for the communists, I didn't speak out because I wasn't a communist. When they came for the Jews, I didn't speak out because I wasn't a Jew. When they came for me, there was no one left to speak out. And even though the masses followed along, there were those who realized that they had to take a stand. My grandfather at this time was a public school teacher under Adolf Hitler, but he was also a confessing Christian. In the 1939, the Nazis marched into his house, and they demanded that he had to take down the painting of Jesus Christ over a study desk, join the Nazi party, be one of them, conform to their beliefs, and declare his allegiance to Adolf Hitler instead. And my grandfather had to make a choice. He was the only public school teacher in his city who still refused to join the Nazi party because of his faith in Jesus Christ. And the pressure against him grew with every day. But he knew that there could only be one God in his life that he was called to serve. And so he took courage and he stood up to the Nazis and he declared this painting remains. He refused to take it down. He refused to join the Nazi party or be one of them or turn away from his true faith in Jesus Christ and the call that God had given him to live for him and to serve him. But by now, even his very own church had given in to the pressure of the Nazi regime and became the German Reichschurch that Hitler himself had created where Hitler himself had put his bishops and his pastors into place and into the pulpits that were loyal to him. And my grandfather not only stood alone in his school, in his city, and his society, he stood alone in his church. And when the Nazis marched into his church, and when they replaced the cross with a swastika and German flags, when instead of Jesus Christ, just political slogans and false doctrines were preached, everything rebelled in him. This is the house of God where the gospel of Jesus Christ has to be preached. He protested. But the people were too mesmerized by the inspiring and empowering messages of this new age dawning and blinded by Hitler's appeal to all their good German values than to pay attention to the warning voices of their time. So my grandfather started a small underground Bible study at his home meeting with people secretly at his house. And my aunt Wildtrot remembered when I interviewed her later, she said there was a knock at the door, and then a man would come in, and he would take his jacket, put it on the hanger, and disappear in the study room. And a little later, there was another knock at the door, and somebody would sneak in, take his coat, put it on the hanger, disappear in the study room, and a little later, another one, another one. And they all came at different times as to not cause suspicion that there was a secret meeting going on. And then behind the closed doors, my aunt could hear how they were praying. How they were praying for discernment so that they would not be misled. How they were seeking guidance from the Word of God, reading the Bible, singing hymns, so that they could stand their ground and have discernment, and not be misled in a world of political turmoil and spiritual confusion. Someone from my grandfather's own church that had now turned Reich's church betrayed him to the Nazis. 
for his underground Bible studies. My grandfather lost his career as a teacher. They took away his house, they threatened his family, and finally they sent him into the battlefields of World War II, final destination, Russian front, to get rid of him. The ultimate punishment for dissidents, to silence his uncomfortable voice. And yet he experienced miracles of God's faithfulness throughout the war. God spared his life many times. He survived Russian captivity. He was pulled in the last moment from execution while everybody else was shot. After six years of war, he returned home alive, proclaiming as he did before, I know that my Redeemer lives. When Nazi Germany was in ruins and rubble and ashes, my grandfather and their family still stood on the firm foundation that they had built their lives on, their faith in Jesus Christ and the Christian values they had lived. When I asked him later, how did you know so early that Hitler was a false prophet and deceiver? He answered, and I'm paraphrasing, I just prayed for discernment so I would not be misled. When Hitler rose to power and said that God had placed him there, when the gospel of Jesus Christ was replaced with all kinds of other gospels, but instead of repentance, salvation, and eternal life, only national pride and prosperity and victory were preached, and the crowds cheered for him. I felt a check in my spirit, and I prayed to God for wisdom and discernment to stand my ground. Grandpa knew that evil doesn't come as obvious evil so it could be recognized. Evil comes disguised as good, so it can deceive and mislead. Evil doesn't come as obvious darkness, so it could be feared. It comes in the garment of light, so it could be marveled at and adored. Evil always disguises its true nature, so it can deceive and mislead many. It worked in Germany, and I am very ashamed. My nation was misled. Even Christians and churches believed what Hitler said. Others didn't, but had grown complacent. Some saw the danger, but were afraid to speak out. Others went along to stay safe and not take up an unpopular position. Some want to please the government and hope to gain some power and influence themselves. And many simply were confused and followed the crowd. But some within the professing church of Jesus Christ and some within their own personal lives stood their ground because of one important spiritual gift, discernment. On my tours through the USA, people often ask me, do you, think, do you think something like this could ever happen again? Maybe in our country? Or could it? Could the church lose its focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ, of repentance, salvation, and eternal life, in, ex in exchange for a more positive Christianity, more enticing gospels, more worldly causes, and drift into a state of spiritual confusion? Is it maybe already happening? The Bible says in 2 Timothy 4, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap upon themselves teachers, and they will turn their eyes and ears away from the truth. For a decade, I had the privilege to travel through the USA. I love this country, and I love its people, and I'm married to a wonderful American. But I've also made my observations, and I've seen how the society has become more and more secular, how moral values are disappearing, how worldly agendas are pushed on us and sometimes even welcomed, how God is being removed from public life while faith in Him is growing more superficial and light. We have entered an age of indifferentism, pluralism, relativism, we live in a society that has lost its moral bearings and spiritual convictions. And people are bombarded from every direction. The media, the internet, the movie and entertainment industry, they all battle to define their morals and values. And a, and a, a secular society and education system pressures them to conform to the world and to the world's convictions. And when they seek insight and directions from different role models in our society, they are often led down a path of confusion 
where right and wrong seems interchangeable and truth is relative. But people are looking for direction. They are looking for a firm foundation to build their lives on, a foundation that will last. They are looking for solid answers. But the world is not providing them. The world is only providing deception. Satan promises freedom, but he delivers bondage. He promises fulfillment, but delivers emptiness. He promises love, but delivers hurt and pain. He promises pleasure, but serves broken hearts. He promises supernatural bliss and brings spiritual death. So people look up to their spiritual leaders for answers and direction. Unfortunately, many of them have lost the fire and courage these days to give a solid answer as well. And instead of leading searching hearts to Christ, many provide a superficial feel-good-about-yourself gospel of universal love and tolerance, self-fulfillment, success, happiness, that leaves people outwardly satisfied, but inwardly still lost. Maybe the problem of this time is not that our world, our societies and governments are turning increasingly secular. Jesus already told us about this and told us to be light and salt in that world. Maybe the problem of our time is that the church of Jesus Christ itself is turning more and more secular and starts conforming to the ways of the world instead of being light and salt in the world. The American evangelist Mike Yoder once said to me, the Greek took Christianity and turned it into a philosophy. The Romans took Christianity and turned it into a government. The Europeans took Christianity and turned it into a culture. We Americans took Christianity and turned it into a business. And every businessman and marketing strategist knows to better sell your product, you have to make it more appealing to the people. And slowly but steadily, the gospel of Jesus Christ, of sin, repentance, salvation, and eternal life, has also been replaced in many parts of this country with a more positive Christianity, a gospel of nationalism, patriotism, prosperity, and victory for the American people. And then the recession hit, and the economy crumbled, and unemployment rose, and we find ourselves once again in a place of political, economic turmoil and spiritual confusion with people on both sides looking for a strong man who can fix it all and make their country great again. And you might be nervously wondering, am I going to compare the church in Nazi Germany to the people on the one side? where there's a candidate who professes the Christian faith and proclaims a great vision of America, or to the people on the other side, where there's a candidate who professes to uphold Christian values and proclaims a great vision for America. Relax. I am not here to address a political battle in the USA or to discuss the candidates or presidents. That you will have to figure out. I'm a German citizen. I don't get to vote. But more than being a citizen of any nation or a member of any political cause or party, I am called to preach the gospel and to point to a much more important battle that we are called to fight in the midst of it at any time in history, at any place. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. We read in Ephesians 6.12, not against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers in this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Stand firm then, with a belt of truth buckled around your waist, with a breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with a readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take out the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, 
which is the Word of God. This is an important time in America's history. And as I travel across the USA, I hear this on both sides. The one side says this is an important battle of democracy versus ideology. The other side says this is an important battle of godliness versus secularism. And God says to both of them in Colossians 3 verse 8, Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principle of this world, and not according to Christ. And in the midst of this political turmoil and spiritual battle stands the church of Jesus Christ, his beloved bride. And God says to her in Proverbs 3.21, Preserve sound judgment and discernment. Do not let them out of your sight. Yet his church has long given in to sin and compromise, to indifference and complacency, while expecting of their political leaders to build them a Christian nation. I believe this is an important time in America's history for the Christian church to remember that the task of spiritual transformation of any nation, the great commission of Jesus Christ, has not been given to politicians and government, but to the Christian church. Regardless who will be in power, this is our task. We have to pick up that banner. We have to carry it. On my travels, I often ask people, what do you do to build God's kingdom? I vote my values. Said, that is very respectable, I appreciate this. But now tell me, what do you do to build God's kingdom? Or I vote for Christian values. And again, I say, well, that is very noble, but tell me, what do you do to build God's kingdom? And though this continues, this discussion just continues, and I'm always being directed back to the same answer. I just vote my values. And while I respect and appreciate this, I say, may I kindly su suggest that there might be something that is even more important than just voting your values, and that is living your values. Because if we merely vote our values, we leave the task of spiritual transformation to the hands of politicians who may or may not live up to it. But if we live our Christian values, we can transform our society from within, starting with our own hearts and lives, reaching our families and neighbors, impacting our communities, being Christ in our schools, in our work, in our marketplaces, transforming our cities, our states, and our nation. The Christian church has never been given so much freedom and opportunities to reach people as in America. We have Christian megachurches, Christian music industry, Christian movie industry, Christian entertainment industry, Christian media, Christian bookstores, Christian schools and colleges, and even political parties. And yet it seems we have never been so ineffective to impact hearts for Christ and change the spiritual climate in our society. Maybe it is because we have started to look like the world rather than being light and salt in it. Maybe we have given in to sin and compromise, to worldly desires, to lust and materialism. Maybe we have lost our power, our fire, and our testimony. Mahatma Gandhi once said, I like your Christ. I just don't like your Christians, because your Christians don't act like your Christ. Could it be that so many Christians and even spiritual leaders these days have started to believe that standing on biblical values is something that happens every four years at the voting booth? I remember the elections we had in communist East Germany. Yeah, we had free elections, but we only had one party and one candidate to vote for. You couldn't even make a shake mark. The name was already written on. All you could do was take the ballot, fold it, and put it into a box. And if you didn't go to a vote, they came with that box to your house so you could fold the ballot and put it in the box. And if you did go to a vote, they even had a voter's booth where you could go in and close the curtain for voter's secrecy. Hello, with one party and one candidate, what do you need voter's secrecy for? It was all just an illusion. And no matter how many people voted or didn't go to a vote, the government-controlled media always reported a 99.9% .9 voter's turnout 
all ruling and uniformity, all voting in uniformity for the ruling Communist Party. And the only way we Christians could make our Christian voices be heard was by living our faith, by praying for our leaders, by loving those who persecuted us. And now I live in America, where people have the privilege to let their Christian voices be heard in their society, their culture, and even in their politics. But with this privilege comes responsibility to also live for Christ, to be an effective witness to our faith in whatever personal, professional, or political sphere of influence God has placed us. And here are just a few examples from the hot-button issues of the day. If you are pro-life as I am, let's commit to live pro-life as well. Let's commit to honor the sanctity and dignity of human life before the womb and after the womb through sickness and health, through poverty and wealth, through war and peace, and embracing our young and honoring our elderly, and being good stewards to the life and creation that God has given us. Yeah. And let's commit to lives of moral integrity, because the lack thereof is the root of all moral problems in our society. When I was a teen, I committed myself to pro-life, even behind the Berlin Wall of Communist East Germany, and I pledged true love rates. And with the grace of God, I lived it for 35 years of my life, and even afterwards, and was fortunate to find the most precious woman who had been waiting for me on the other side of the world as well. If we want to live in a pro-life society, ladies and gentlemen, let's commit ourselves to moral integrity before our marriages and throughout our marriages, and then all we do and set examples and be a witness of our faith to others, regardless what regime we live under, regardless what party will be in power. And if you believe in the biblical, defini in the biblical definition of marriage as I do, let's live biblical marriages as well, which is not just a marriage between a man and a woman, but between a man and a woman before God for life, loving, honoring, respecting each other, and applying God's word and principles to everyday living with Christ as the center of everything. There are so many broken hearts and broken homes and broken families in this country. There's so much dysfunction and domestic abuse, even among people that call themselves Christian. There are men who tell their wives, the Bible says, I am the head of the house and you must submit, so do as I command. This is not the definition of a biblical marriage at all. Wives, submit to your husbands. Come on. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. Ephesians 5.24 Men, if we want our wives to respect us, and submit to our leadership, we must be Christ to them, and love them, and respect them, and serve them, honor them, treat them right, put their desires above our own, and yes, help with the chores in the house, or do the dishes, and sure, we will never be perfect, and need God's word to remind us every day, and I'm also sure that now that I said that, guess who Carol will sign up for kitchen duty throughout the next week? <laughs> Because she holds me up to the messages I preach, and I ask her to. Because people will not see the way we vote, but they will watch the way we live, and how we treat each other. And if we allow Christ to affect our lives, our marriages, and our families. My grandparents were married for 65 years, and they never let a day go by that they did not end together in prayer. And they would never let the sun go down over a misunderstanding or a disagreement. And my wife and I have taken inspiration from this, and we wear the rings, and we have committed our marriage to these biblical principles as well. And together, my grandparents lived their faith and their marriage and their life through, Nazi, through the Nazi regime of Hitler Germany, throughout World War II and communism, from the rise of the Berlin Wall to its celebrated fall, 
on the leaders and governments that have come and gone. And if we dedicate ourselves to live biblical marriages, build strong Christian families, and set examples, we can be an effective witness to our faith in Jesus Christ in this society as well. And I understand that Christians in this country are frustrated, that they took God out of public places and the Ten Commandments out of the courthouses as well. And while this is unfortunate, I often wondered if the display of our Judeo-Christian heritage alone has truly made us a godly nation, when half of our married Christian couples would end up in this very courthouse under the very Ten Commandments, asking the judge that what God had put together, man should put asunder. And I understand that sometimes there are circumstances that cannot be resolved. There's hurt and there's pain. There are cases of unfaithfulness, abuse, and abandonment. And Christ weeps his tears with those that are impacted by it. And I know that every time we fall short of God's holy standard in any area of our lives and turn to him in sorrow and with a broken heart, he meets us with compassion. And he offers his love and forgiveness, his healing and his restoration so we can be whole again. And yet, our society and even many of our churches make it too easy for us these days to make our commitments to God and then walk away from them in so many areas of our lives. And more than just battling to get references to God back into our public places and the Ten Commandments back into our courtrooms, let's first strive to get the Word of God and His commandments back into our hearts and in our lives to live it, to follow it, to honor it the best we can. This is how we can build a godly nation. Yet, so many Christians are more concerned with getting the church back into power than getting the power back into the church. You are the salt of the earth, Jesus tells us in Matthew 15, 13. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. And this, ladies and gentlemen, I fear more than living under secular regimes and societies where a committed Christian life can always provide an effective witness for Jesus Christ as the light and salt that God has called us to be. I come from a nation that once put God on their banners and campaign slogans, their public offices and soldiers' belt buckles, but didn't live for God in their hearts and lives. And this nation fell along with the Christian church because they had ceased to live their Christian values, to be like Jesus, and to follow him. But I also come from a nation where, in the midst of this, it brought forth heroes of faith like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a simple disciple of Jesus Christ, who required more of the Christian church than to be satisfied with an outward profession of Christianity by their culture, their government, or the church itself. A man who spoke against cheap grace, against comfortable Christianity, against indifference, complacency, and compromise, and who gave his life for the calling of costly grace, a faith that cost us all we have, a faith that cost him all he had, even his very life at the hands of the Nazis, to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ and to impact the world. And finally... I come from a nation where decades later, behind the Berlin Wall of communist East Germany, the Church of Jesus Christ that had learned from its mistakes, that had sought God's forgiveness, and remembered the strength it had, would rise up again. And I was 17 years old when I took part in the peaceful revolution that started in the East German churches, proclaimed the gospel in the streets and places, set a fire of flame that could not be put out, brought down the Berlin Wall, and changed history. It left one former communist politician say about their fall, our government and military was prepared for everything, but not for burning candles and not for faith and prayer Against that, we had no weapons. And to this very day, 
Communist China blames Christianity for the fall of communism in Eastern Europe because they have realized that the Christian faith can impact lives, transform our societies, and even change history. And the French politician George Benjamin Clemenceau once quoted, or is being quoted as saying, if Christians just started to make real with their faith, it would be a revolution like the world has never seen before. There would be no need to have any other revolution afterwards. We need such revolution, and that needs to start with us. If we as Christian Church reclaim the Great Commission, we can change and transform our society from within, starting with our own hearts and lives, reaching our neighbors, our communities, our schools, our colleges, our workplaces, our cities, our states, and our nation. We can make a difference. Whether we live under a dictatorship of freedom, and our religious or secular governments, we are given a great commission that transcends time and history, that transcends nation, empires, and leaders that will come and go, that transcends political battles that will be won and lost, that transcends kingdoms that will rise and fall. The gospel of Jesus Christ still has the power to convict, to renew, to transform, to grant salvation and everlasting life, and to bless our lives with a hope, a joy, and a power that is much stronger and much greater than any worldly promise. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given unto you as well, Matthew 6, 33. But seek first his kingdom, for this kingdom will last, even if everything else might be taken from us, if our economy and material securities are shaken, if our jobs and possessions are uncertain, when we struggle with our finances and with our health. This hope in Christ will last, even when we encounter tragedy and hardships, when we go through trials and tribulation, when we face a world that is opposing the faith we have. And I know that people in this country are afraid that their freedoms might be slipping away, are concerned where this country is headed politically, culturally, and spiritually. But let's take heart. We have good news to proclaim. Do not be afraid. It's the beginning of the gospel as angels announce the birth of Christ to shepherds. And do not be afraid. It's the end of the gospel as Jesus ascends to heaven. For in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus says in John 16, 33. And then he leaves us with his Holy Spirit, the Great Commission, and his power to do his work until he will return. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus commissions us in Matthew 28 baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you until the very end of this age. Amen.